my name is Jim Hawk. I'm the Executive Director of Neighbor to Neighbor. We are live this week to interview the top four mayoral candidates in metropolitan Nashville and Davidson County on issues most affecting our, our neighborhoods. Neighbor to Neighbor is a nonprofit and nonpartisan organization founded by neighborhood leaders across Davidson County. Since 1997, we've been equipping residents and neighborhood leaders with the tools they need to improve, preserve, and improve their neighborhoods. We are committed to helping develop informed and effective leaders and strong and powerful neighborhood organizations. Neighbor to Neighbor does not endorse candidates. Our one-on-one -on -one interviews are designed to provide candidates with an opportunity to make voters aware of their positions on the major issues facing our neighborhoods. I'm here today with Representative John Clements, who is a candidate for the mayor in the upcoming election. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I appreciate Good it. Good to see you. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity. Well, let, let's get to these questions since our All time right. is short. So, uh, we've heard a lot of talk during the campaign about the importance of neighborhoods. Right. So, we thought to start by asking, why are neighborhoods important? Well, neighborhoods are the character of our city. You know, I'm a former neighborhood association president, so I certainly understand the value of protecting the character of our neighborhoods. You know, you can drive across four, four, or uh, I-40 from one coast to another, and a lot of the cities look the same, but not Nashville. Nashville is different and so special because of all the neighborhoods uh, that make up the fabric of, of our city, and it, it's just remarkable. And we must do a better job of protecting the character of our neighborhoods across Nashville. So uh, we're talking about neighborhoods, so why don't you tell us a little bit about what neighborhood you live in, yeah. and what ways have you and your family been involved in those neighborhoods? So I live in Belmont Hillsborough neighborhood. It's the uh, longest continually operating neighborhood association in Nashville, uh, started by Gene Tassell and others. I just had the good pleasure of naming the bridge over 440 on 21st Avenue for Gene Tassell last year, actually, and he and Reverend Bill Barnes and others. Uh, were mentors of mine, more or less. And so I've been involved in the community since we moved in. We moved into our neighborhood in 2008, and my wife and I did. We bought our first house over there on Belmont Boulevard. And I've been a neighborhood association president. I've been involved with, with nonprofits throughout the community. And we've just really taken an active role. You know, we have three small boys. And so there's nothing more important than making sure that the neighborhood and the city in which we live uh, is, is safe, and it's a great neighborhood for families like our own. You have been in many neighborhoods, especially during this election cycle. Um, what are you hearing residents say are the biggest issues impacting our neighborhoods? Yeah, so we've held a kitchen table talks, is what we call them, across this entire city. We've done almost 50 of them, actually, in every neighborhood across this entire city. And as you know, it's a big county. Uh, and so the most remarkable thing is that the top three or four issues are the same regardless of where you are in the city. It's just the perspective is different depending on the neighborhood you're, you're visiting. And so, you know, those are public education, quality of the public schools, uh, affordable housing and affordability issues facing families across the city, and then infrastructure, both above ground and below ground. So, you know, traffic, obviously everybody talks about traffic, but and transportation infrastructure needs, but also water infrastructure. The water infrastructure underneath our city is archaic, you know, with increased rainfalls, increased density, the stormwater and wastewater system underneath our city is, is just a doom for failure, to be honest with you, if we don't do something about it. So those are the biggest issues we hear about. And of course, always public safety is a big concern uh, in many neighborhoods. And we hear a little bit about youth violence across the city. But really, when you talk about public safety and youth violence, you know, those are symptoms of some underlying issues like poverty, uh, economic inequality across the city, and lack of access to educational opportunities, and public transportation, and then expo you know adverse childhood experiences are playing a big role in that. So all those issues, as you know, they're all connected. And what I remind people is, you know, we once had a mayor that said it's all connected, but I remind people that we're all connected, and we need to start acting like it. Well, uh, you mentioned equity uh, in your comments. Equity's been a big theme. Uh, in this campaign, uh, we speak frequently about how individuals experience inequality. Um, yet neighborhood leaders often tell me that uh, there's a lack of equity in neighborhoods. 
um, how Medco's resources are distributed to neighborhoods, uh, and where projects are located or not located. Um, our neighbors in North and South Nashville frequently claim that they're being dumped on. And then we have neighbors across the city saying that all of our resources are focused on the downtown area, uh, really to the detriment of the rest of the county. How would your administration work to ensure neighborhoods are treated more equitably? Yeah, so the reality is, you know, everybody in town is left scratching their heads asking where the money is. And, you know, and we have certain parts of our town that are doing just fine. Downtown's doing just fine. And I think once upon a time, you know, when Mayor Bredesen and others, they said, you know, let's, they were strong mayors and had a good vision. They said, let's strengthen the urban core. And then once we get the urban core strong, let's, it'll spread out. We'll spread out this economic uh, benefit across the city. Well, instead, what happened is you saw some people in the urban core start making a lot of money. And they really liked making a lot of money. So they started layering on top of it. And instead of allowing that model to evolve and work its way out into the community, we've seen intense concentration downtown. I mean, you see a lot of money going back in and feeding that tourism uh, economy rather than spreading it around the city in an equitable manner. And the other aspect of this is, is uh, you know, for, I, I think it's fair to say entire communities have been left out for decades, uh, whether as a result of systemic racism or redlining, you know, is still playing a part uh, to this day. It has, still has an impact on communities to this day. So when you look at White's Creek, Bordeaux, Antioch, and those areas, they're asking, well, not only where is the money going, but why are we still being left out entirely at the equation? If you look at where sidewalk dollars are being spent, you look where development incentives are being provided, you're not seeing them in Bordeaux and Antioch. You know, we can't even get a police precinct built down there right now. Uh, and that's really frustrating for the residents of these communities, and it should be frustrating. And so as mayor, I look forward to working with these communities, incentivizing development in these communities that have been left behind for too long. And, and you know, and really promoting the growth and providing the infrastructure, you know, because sidewalks are badly needed. Uh, and now we just cut bus routes. So some people, you know, who have to walk in a, in a ditch or along the side of the road to get to a bus stop, you know, it was five minutes, but now they're walking to the bus stop just increased to 30 minutes because the route got shut down. So, you know, we need to better facilitate these infrastructure. If you look at certain parts of town, you see bus stops with benches and covers. You go to other parts of town, you don't see a bus stop with any bench. You don't see it even as a, a protective covering. So, you know, it doesn't take long to figure out where the money's going. We just need to make sure and make a conscious effort to spread it across the city in a more equitable fashion. Uh, you were speaking about uh, rapid development. Uh, many residents across Davidson County increasingly feel overwhelmed um, by the rapid development in their neighborhoods uh, and really frustrated in their attempts to understand and engage in the metro planning and zoning process. Um, we did a 10-month effort here with 28 neighborhood and community leaders from across Davidson County, uh, really trying to identify the barriers to resident engagement we identified over 50 of those. Um, how will your administration uh, work to address this rapid development and help residents better understand and engage in the planning process? Yes, yeah, so several ways we can do this. And I think we have to acknowledge the fact that right now we're just seeing this unprecedented growth and, and, and almost growth for growth's sake without any conscious uh, decision making or being really mindful or thoughtful about how we grow. We're continuing to develop into buffer zones in our watershed and along creeks under floodplains. We continue to tear down one house and put up two or three in its place without thinking about the impact that has on our wastewater and stormwater system. So I think starting here um, and, and just acknowledging that and then working back from the beginning is an important way to approach this. So it's, you know, the appointments the mayor makes to the Planning Commission, the Board of Zoning Appeals, the Historical Zoning Commission need to reflect, uh, rep neighborhoods need to be better represented. We need to have neighborhood residents on those boards because Developers have enough rooms in government right now. We need to have residents who are interested in protecting the character of our city on those boards. Also want to really take a look at, um, we're going to revitalize and strengthen the mayor's office in neighborhoods to be a resource for residents, to level that playing field with developers. Because all too often, you know, in my current state legislative district, uh, we just had an instance over on Knob Road where 
you have a developer who wants to come in and put up 10 houses and the neighborhood residents don't feel like they have a say in the process. And you're always behind the curve because the developers have their lawyers, they know the process very well, and by the time it gets to a certain point before the neighborhood knows about it, they feel like they're too far behind the curve. So what we need is a, a mayor's office of neighborhoods that's a resource for residents and an advocate for residents. So, you know, rather than neighborhoods having to try to raise money to hire a lawyer just to try to uh, have a voice, they can rely on the mayor's office. They should be able to rely on the mayor's office to represent them and be an advocate for them to slow everything down, make sure that everyone's opinions are heard and everything is done in a more thoughtful manner. Because it really is, we see this continued growth and a lot of neighborhood residents don't feel like they have a voice. So I think the mayor's office should provide that voice to them. And, and we have a real opportunity to do that. I think, you know, Mayor Purcell started us in, in the right direction on that, as that mayor's office of neighborhoods. But, for, you know, for some reason it's just fallen away. We need to strengthen that office to really be a strong advocate for neighborhood residents across Nashville. And I think we need to take a look at the SP process. You know, all too often we see uh, just the, the planning department falling back on Nashville Next, you know, which kind of lays out where they want density and where they want this and that. And that's the excuse for approving all this spot zoning. And I think the SP process really is spot zoning. I think we need to take a close look at the SP process, whether or not that's the best way to go about these things. Uh, because just allowing, you know, people to tear down a house and put up two or three tall and skinnies isn't, isn't always the, a good option. You know, it's good for density, but is it good for Nashville? Is it good for neighborhoods? And so I think we need to be more mindful in how we conduct this process. So uh, one of the things that have been developed are opportunity zones which some of the audience may not know, these are federal incentives designed to, they're designed to stimulate economic growth in lower income neighborhoods. Um, and it's a federal program. Uh, many community and neighborhood leaders have raised concerns uh, that the program actually works to gentrify and displace long-term residents. So what are your views on opportunity zones and how will you address the concerns that neighborhood leaders have raised? Well, opportunity zones are concerning. Um, I think, you know, if we're going to look at areas where we want to spur economic development, I think, you know, that's what the TIF program or tax increment financing program was designed to do. I think we've seen that be misused. You know, they're using TIF dollars for Sobro, Rolling Mill Hill, the Gulch. Um, so the TIF program, I think, should more accurately reflect uh, the, the boundaries of that or those zones should more accurately be aligned with opportunity zones. Start there. But with opportunity zones, you know, that was, that was uh, created with the federal tax law. And what its really impact is, is you've got a lot of uh, big money coming from outside of Nashville, outside of Tennessee, coming in and wanting to just parachute a lot of money into areas. So the concerns of residents about gentrification, about the, all those concerns are valid. Because what you're having is people coming in looking for tax havens. Because if you go in there and invest those, those monies into these properties and rehab existing uh, properties or invest money, you can get away tax-free after 10 years. You're on, all your capital gains are tax-free on any of these investments. So we're going to continue to see money parachute into Nashville from across the country, maybe even across the world, um, into these opportunity zones. While the, the theory is sound, it's really a, a tax break for the super wealthy and hedge funds and others. Uh, so it's, it's very concerning. We're going to have to figure out the balancing, uh, the way to balance that a little bit better. Because, you know, when you have outsiders coming into your neighborhood and just to get a tax break or a tax shelter, that's going to create a lot of issues. And I think we're going to see that more and more in the coming years as a challenge. Uh, so one of the more common issues uh, we hear expressed in urban and suburban uh, neighborhoods is the lack of sidewalks. Right. Uh, successive administrations have been addressing this issue, uh, and yet we seem to be decades away from any resolution. So, what's your administration going to do differently? Well, you have to make it a priority. I mean, it's all about infrastructure, right? You got, and you have to be willing to make the tough decisions necessary to fund this infrastructure. And right now, you know, we find ourselves uh, with debt payments that are eating up over 10% of the annual budget. Uh, and so we're going to have to figure out where the revenue is going to come from and make tough decisions necessary. I think we're losing a lot of money right now with outsourcing our sidewalk construction. I think we're paying a, too much per square foot. I think if we had Metro employees or other locally owned 
uh, companies doing this, we would, we would be paying considerably less. Uh, so we start there, save money in how we do this. But if you look at Walt Bike Nashville and, you know, and their proposals, uh, at the current rate, if we invest $30 million a year, it's going to take us 23 years just to get where we should be today. So, you know, this is something where we're really going to have to figure out a way to generate revenue and invest it into sidewalks. And sidewalks are so important because it doesn't, doesn't you know, connect, um, you know, people to a bus stop or, you know, move people around. It connects neighborhoods. And I think anything we can do to connect neighborhoods and promote connectivity, um, I think that's a good thing. And that's what sidewalks do. And not only that, it facilitates exercise and, you know, gets people out and walking around through their community in a much safer way than having to walk on the side of a road or uh, on the side, you know, in, in a ditch, uh, like a lot of our students have to do just to get to school. So sidewalks are very important, and we hear a lot of concerns about that. And I think, you, you know, getting back to the equitable distribution of funds, again, you would see entire parts of our community go without sidewalks. Whereas others, you know, my neighborhood is, you know, it's an old neighborhood, it's a historic neighborhood, and it has plenty of sidewalks. But other parts of our city need them. And we should be, you know, looking to expand the sidewalk network across the entire city to benefit all residents. So, one last question. Um, neighborhood organizations need a place to gather and meet. Uh, schools, community centers, police stations uh, seem to be obvious places. Uh, and, and, and newer precincts, police precincts, were even built with that in mind. Uh, yet, we're beginning to hear more and more from neighborhood leaders that it's becoming difficult to meet in these spaces. Uh, restricted hours, um, there are rates now being charged in some places for neighborhoods to meet there. Um, how will your administration work to make these spaces more available? Yes, so that's really concerning. I just recently attended a neighborhood organization in my state house district a couple weeks ago when we met outside. We were supposed to be able to get into the police precinct. And it was locked and, you know, we couldn't get in. So we literally met on the steps of the police precinct. You know, and you're not going to stop people from wanting to organize and talk about the issues that are important to them in their neighborhood. And so I applaud the neighborhood organization for that. But, you know, we're fortunate across this city to have very active faith-based community and churches that are willing to open their doors. Uh, schools, where possible, are able to open their doors. But I think it all starts with the leadership in the mayor's office, as with most of these issues. It's really... You know, having a former neighborhood organization president in the mayor's office who can speak firsthand about the needs of neighborhood associations and just the importance of being able to organize and meet and discuss the issues of importance for residents is vital. And having a mayor who's willing to acknowledge that and, and, and put pressure on the MNPD to open up the precincts and make them unlimited and, you know, and, and the schools with working with MNPS to do that, I think it, we'll, we'll see a lot of progress in that regard. I'm cert certainly empathetic to neighborhood leaders uh, who, whose jobs are tough enough. But, you know, having to then worry about finding somewhere to meet is, is, is just another challenge with which we're confronted. So we've learned a lot today. Thank you for being here. We thank appreciate you. your time and wish you the best on the road. Well, thank you very much, and I appreciate everything y'all are doing to improve the quality of life in Nashville. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you.